One might assume that a place associated with stories from the Bible would be safe, but that's not the case here. In Hayes County, Texas lies Jacob's Well, a submerged sinkhole filled by a natural spring. This spot attracts not only those seeking a refreshing swim, but also adventurous thrill-seekers, some of whom have mysteriously vanished. What mysteries lie beneath the depths of this well? Join us as we unravel the dangerous truth of Jacob's Well, a tale of discovery and exploration. According to stories from the past, settlers stumbled upon Jacob's Well around 1950. It's said to be about 12 feet wide and back then, water shot up from it as high as 5 feet. Instead of diving into the well, these settlers used it for drinking water. They even figured out how to use its power to run a sawmill. They decided to name it Jacob's Well, inspired by its grand appearance, similar to tales from the Bible. The temperature of the water remained steady all year, at about 20 degrees Celsius. Over the years, explorers have delved into the well and mapped out at least 4,500 feet of its passages. One such explorer was Wayne Russell. He was a seasoned explorer who began his caving adventures at just 15 years old in 1962. And while it might seem like a cave linked to stories from the Bible would be safe, that's not the case at all for Wayne Russell. He went diving with his pals John Wilcox and Danny Self at Jacob's Well on February 26, 1984, and that was the last he was heard of. When it was time to leave, it was Wayne who signaled to the team to commence ascending. However, as they ascended, Wayne was missing. Diving into Jacob's Well is not without its risks. The passages are narrow, making it necessary to remove tanks even at the surface. Surrounding the well are dangerous rocks, and some thrill-seekers dive headfirst, performing risky flips and stunts. Today, this well is known as the second-largest fully submerged cave in Texas, reaching an average depth of 120 feet. It's located within 80 acres of protected land. Jacob's Well gets its water from the Trinity Aquifer, which covers much of the southwestern part of the state. However, due to development in the area, the well no longer gushes water at the impressive rate of 170 gallons per second. Instead, it only creates a gentle ripple on the surface, with the water eventually flowing into Cypress Creek. A fascinating saga of flow and danger. In the year 2000, something remarkable happened. Jacob's Well stopped flowing for the first time. Since then, it has ceased its flow on four occasions, with the most recent occurrence in July 2022. This stoppage occurs when groundwater levels drop, resulting in reduced water pressure that prevents the spring from bubbling up. Interestingly, this decrease in flow rate has its advantages for divers. With less water rushing into the cave system, it becomes easier for them to enter without having to fight against a strong current. However, despite this seemingly favorable condition, Jacob's Well remains a dangerous cave system to explore. Cave diving usually involves risks, but Jacob's Well presents additional challenges that heighten the danger. Firstly, divers must struggle with the force of the water flow as they navigate through the narrow openings between chambers. These passages often slope downwards, adding to the complexity of the dive. Furthermore, the presence of unstable gravel worsens the risk. This gravel can pile up in the already tight passageways, further restricting movement and increasing the potential for being trapped. One particularly challenging section is known as the birth canal, located around 70 feet deep. Here, divers descend a gravel slope before encountering a narrow opening, sometimes as slim as 15 inches. The amount of gravel present determines the width of this passage, adding an unpredictable element to the dive. The slope leads to a larger chamber, but often divers find themselves needing to clear away gravel to make a path. They have to push their gear ahead of them through a narrow channel before entering the chamber. This passage is so tight that it's often described as being birthed into the next chamber. Throughout the years, Jacob's Well has sadly claimed the lives of as many as 12 divers. There may be even more deaths that haven't been officially documented. Nowadays, diving in the cave system requires a permit. Tragedy at Jacob's Well In early September 1979, a group of adventurous friends decided to camp out for the night and embark on a daring dive into Jacob's Well. Since their goal was to venture into the cave itself, 
They chose the cover of night to avoid any interference from swimmers. Around midnight on the 9th, the group entered the water, descending to the first chamber at approximately 25 feet. Among them were two experienced divers, Kent and Mark, who had explored Jacob's well before. Kent had long been pondering the true depth of the cave. Jacob's well consists of a series of descending chambers, each getting smaller as you go deeper. Beyond the initial chamber lies a narrow corridor leading to a larger second chamber, descending to about 55 feet. Then, there's a third chamber at an angle, reaching depths of around 75 feet. This is where the dive truly becomes challenging. Between the third and fourth chambers lies a narrow passage, so tight that divers must remove their tanks to squeeze through. Kent had heard conflicting tales about what lay beyond this passage. Some claimed it was a dead end, while others spoke of a vast chamber waiting to be explored. Despite the risks, Kent couldn't resist the allure of the unknown. Accompanied by his friend Mark, Kent descended into the third chamber, followed closely by another diver named Joe. Ahead, Kent and Mark inspected the tight opening to the fourth chamber. To Joe's horror, they began removing their tanks and backing into the darkness without a clear plan or backup lights. Joe, realizing the danger they faced, signaled desperately with his light, but it was too late. Mark's light vanished into the abyss. Joe, left alone in the dim chamber, understood the gravity of their situation. With less air and venturing deeper, Kent and Mark were at risk of running out of air sooner. In a desperate attempt to guide them back, Joe banged on his tanks and dropped his light into the passage. Then, he ascended to the surface, consumed by uncertainty about his friend's fate. As he waited on the water's edge, a sudden change in the water's color signaled trouble below. It could only mean one of two things, a panicked struggle stirring up sediment or a deadly collapse within the cave. The outcome remained uncertain, leaving Joe to struggle with the terrifying possibility of loss. Joe emerged at the surface and informed the other divers of the situation. They quickly contacted local authorities for assistance. The Jacobs Well Rescue Mission Paul Battaglia, a police officer and experienced cave diver, received a call to organize a rescue operation an hour after the initial distress call. He swiftly headed to Don Dibble's house, where Dibble, a former Navy diver, cave diving expert, and owner of the local dive shop, resides. Dibble was also a member of the Hayes County Volunteer Body Recovery Unit, along with Battaglia. Together, Dibble and Battaglia discussed the plan for the rescue operation, although deep down, they knew it was more likely to be a body recovery mission. They understood that the strategy for recovering a body would be similar to that of a rescue, with slight adjustments. With their plan in place, they contacted other members of the recovery unit and gathered equipment from Dibble's dive shop. They then made their way to Jacob's Well, a journey of about 15 minutes from the dive shop. Upon arrival, they found it still dark, but a group from Pasadena was already in the water, searching for the missing divers. They informed Dibble that they hadn't been able to locate Mark and had extensively searched the cave system. The Pasadena group suspected that Mark and the other missing diver were trapped inside Chamber 4. This suspicion arose from one diver's observation of equipment buried under a gravel slide in the passage leading to Chamber 4. According to reports, this unnamed diver completed two consecutive dives lasting 19 minutes each, spotted the bodies, and then returned home to rest. However, he later developed decompression sickness and required treatment in a recompression chamber. This situation highlights a major challenge in rescue operations. When divers find themselves in trouble, it's often because they're pushing the limits in dangerous environments. This forces rescuers to push those limits even further. Adding to the pressure, they're often racing against the clock, leading to rushed decisions. To manage dive times and ensure safety, dive planning tables are used. These tables calculate how long a diver can stay at a certain depth and how long they need to rest between dives. For instance, at a depth of 140 feet, a diver can only stay for 8 minutes before needing decompression stops during their ascent. Afterward, they must wait at least one and a half hours before diving again for another 8 minutes. Unfortunately, in this case, the diver made two consecutive decompression dives without a break in between, in a desperate attempt to save lives. This led to decompression sickness. 
Despite the constant darkness in the cave regardless of the time of the day, Don's initial instinct was to wait until daylight. Based on his experience recovering bodies, he knew that people are often willing to wait until sunrise. Don decided to send two divers into the water to assist with the situation. When they resurfaced, they informed Don that the recovery wouldn't be straightforward. They couldn't spot the bodies, but they suspected they'd buried under gravel in the sloping passageway leading to Chamber 4. The idea of digging out the bodies unsettled them, especially since more gravel could easily slide down and bury any rescuers attempting to retrieve them. At 10 a.m., Don sent two more divers in. They began removing rocks and gravel at the entrance to Chamber 4, hoping to create a passage to access the next chamber. However, their efforts were in vain as any rocks they removed were quickly replaced by more gravel. Don decided to enter the cave himself to assess the situation. He and his buddy took a few extra stage tanks, leaving them at 25 feet and 75 feet for their return journey. As Don reached the entrance of the chamber at 140 feet deep, he found the passage narrowing between the roof and the gravel. He attempted to squeeze in slightly to get a better view of the passageway, but ended up getting trapped when gravel slid in from behind, much like the two divers he was searching for. Despite feeling panicked, Don remained calm and tried to free himself. He attempted to move his hands, but they were stuck tight. As more gravel slid in around him, he started to panic even more. Eventually, with a surge of relief, the gravel released its grip, allowing him to escape the passageway. However, he'd used up so much air in the struggle that his tanks were now empty. In a dazed state, his buddy helped him by jamming his spare regulator into Don's mouth and started to ascend through the chamber. On the other side of the narrow passage known as the birth canal lay a spare cylinder. Don urgently needed to reach it, but the air he accidentally swallowed while struggling caused him trouble. In the water, the air got compressed due to pressure. As Don ascended, the air bubble in his stomach expanded. What was a small amount of air at 140 feet deep then expanded dramatically as he rose towards the surface. By the time he reached the surface, the air in his stomach had expanded to five times its original volume. This expansion caused his stomach to bloat significantly, giving him the appearance of being pregnant. Don was rushed to a recompression chamber for treatment, but unfortunately, it didn't solve his pain. He was then transferred to another hospital, where an x-ray revealed that his stomach was ruptured, and air had filled the cavity. Describing the operation, the doctor compared it to cutting into a basketball, which instantly deflated. To make matters worse, Don's hospital bill left him $8,000 in debt because his insurance had lapsed in the weeks leading up to the accident. However, in the following weeks, the diving community came together to raise funds to help Don cover his medical expenses. Echoes from the Abyss At Jacob's Well, recovery efforts had taken a new direction with the involvement of another leader in the diving community, Don Broad. His plan involved filling net bags with gravel and floating them out with lift bags. Starting at the top of the slope, they would gradually work their way down, ensuring that no gravel slid down to replace what they removed. Broad informed the families and authorities that this process would be lengthy, possibly taking many weeks or even months to excavate the site fully. Broad and his team began the excavating, but it wasn't something that could be kept up for long. Twelve days passed since the disappearance of the two divers, leading to the suspension of the search efforts. Don successfully recuperated from his burst stomach and rejoined his friends to explore Jacob's well once again. Together, they embarked on a mission to secure the area by installing a sturdy grate, ensuring that no diver could venture beyond the birth canal. Months later, Dibble revisited the site, anticipating the security of his grate. However, to his surprise, he discovered it had been removed. Left in its place was a cryptic note boldly declaring, You can't keep us out. Depths of Destiny On Sunday, February 26, 1984, three adventurers ventured into the depths of Jacob's Well, John, Danny, and Wayne Russell. John and Danny were both scuba diving instructors, each with their independent practice, while Wayne was a seasoned caver and cave diver. Equipped with a full set of gear including wetsuits, tanks, regulators, depth gauges, lights, and spare tanks, 
The trio embarked on their journey. Due to the narrow passages they would encounter, they opted not to bring buoyancy compensators. Their journey began at the first level in the initial chamber, which dipped 25 feet below the surface. From there, they secured a safety line vertically to the entrance of the third chamber, which went down to 55 feet. At approximately 85 feet deep, Wayne and John established a new safety line, stretching it horizontally through the third chamber and halfway into the fourth. Wayne led the way into the fifth chamber, navigating through tight openings and laying down a fresh safety line, while John captured the adventure with his camera. Meanwhile, Danny remained in the fourth chamber, ensuring the safety lines were secure and scouring for an old tank left by divers who had tragically perished in 1979. As Wayne and John pressed forward into the depths, Danny explored the dimensions of the fourth chamber, estimating its size to be around 10 feet high and 8 feet wide. After finishing his task, Danny retrieved some extra line, removed a tag, and squeezed through the passage. Upon reaching the fourth chamber, he located the old tank, attached a piece of line to it, and began to follow the safety line back. However, he was taken aback to find that the fifth chamber was incredibly narrow, measuring only about two feet in height. To make matters worse, the visibility was rapidly reducing, causing Danny to feel increasingly anxious. Midway through his retreat, Danny became tangled in the line he had tied to the old tank, halting his progress. After taking a deep breath, he managed to free himself and returned to the fourth chamber. There, he donned his tank again and attempted to pull the old tank through the narrow opening. Meanwhile, Wayne had tied his safety line halfway into the fifth chamber and attached a survey tape, a hundred-foot tape measure, to gauge the length and diameter of the lower chambers. Wayne boldly ventured into the sixth chamber, with John following his safety line and survey tape. Inside, John struggled to capture clear pictures due to the poor visibility. Nevertheless, he sensed the spaciousness of the chamber, noting its muddy bottom, unlike the rocky floors of the previous ones. As Wayne signaled it was time to depart, John retraced his steps along the safety line. However, he encountered a snag when the old tank got stuck at the opening. After dislodging it, he and Danny worked together to maneuver it through. With Danny leading the way, they exited the fourth chamber, followed by John from the fifth and Wayne trailing behind. Reuniting in the third chamber, they found slightly improved visibility compared to the lower depths. Danny inquired about Wayne's whereabouts, and John gestured towards the tunnel, assuming Wayne was occupied with his tasks. Lacking any indication of trouble, they decided to ascend to a shallower depth to begin decompression, expecting Wayne to catch up shortly. However, during their decompression stop, they began to feel worried. They couldn't return because they were running low on air and had already spent too much time underwater. Eventually, they surfaced, but it wasn't until the next day. A dive team from Wimberley discovered Wayne lying on his safety line, his mask still on, and his tank beside him near the entrance of the fifth chamber. After Wayne's tragic passing, his parents found a poem that he had written. This heartfelt poem was read at his funeral on February 29, 1984. Now it's time for today's subscriber pick. In the heart of a small, forgotten town located amidst rolling hills and whispering forests, there lay a mysterious secret known only to a few brave souls. This secret was guarded by the ancient, moss-covered stones of Jacob's Well, a place whispered about in hushed tones and covered in myth and legend. Legend had it that Jacob's Well held the key to unimaginable power. But with great power came great danger, and those who dared to seek its secrets often vanished without a trace. Among the curious few who dared to tread near Jacob's well was a young girl named Evelyn. She was a dreamer, with eyes that sparkled like the stars and a heart filled with boundless curiosity. Ever since she was a child, Evelyn had been drawn to the stories surrounding the well, and as she grew older, her desire to uncover the dangerous truth of Jacob's well only grew stronger. One moonlit night, fueled by determination and a thirst for adventure, Evelyn made her way to Jacob's well. As she swam through the murky depths, Evelyn's senses were overwhelmed by the mysterious silence that surrounded her. But she pressed on, driven by the promise of discovery and the hope of unraveling the secrets that had eluded so many before her. 
Suddenly, a blinding light pierced the darkness, revealing a hidden chamber beneath the surface. Evelyn's heart raced as she beheld the wonders that lay before her, a trove of ancient artifacts, each more enigmatic than the last. But as she reached out to touch them, a voice echoed in the depths of her mind, a voice filled with sorrow and warning. Beware, child of the surface, it whispered, for the power you seek comes at a price greater than you can imagine. With a heavy heart, Evelyn turned away from the chamber and began her ascent to the surface. As she emerged from the depths of Jacob's well, she was greeted by the soft glow of dawn breaking over the horizon. At that moment, Evelyn knew that she had narrowly escaped a fate far worse than death. Plunging into danger, Kent, Mark, and Wayne are just a few of the many individuals who tragically lost their lives in the terrifying depths of Jacob's well. The mysterious allure of Jacob's well hides dangers that even seasoned divers struggle to navigate safely. In a detailed 2001 article featured on Visit Wimberley, author Louis Bond outlined the numerous challenges that come with exploring the complex cave system. Bond highlighted the daunting obstacles, including the dauntingly narrow passages between chambers and the risky presence of a deceptive false chimney, which has trapped unsuspecting divers in its deceptive promise of escape. Venturing into the deeper recesses of the caverns, divers confront dark spaces coupled with layers of gravel and silt, worsening the already dangerous conditions. Visibility becomes a critical concern, particularly when disturbed by the slightest motion, posing a significant threat to those who fail to exercise caution. Despite efforts to deter unauthorized exploration, such as the installation of a more robust grate, tragedies persist. In a gripping incident in 2015, 21-year-old diver Diego Adami narrowly escaped death during a free dive. Diego Adami, a skilled free diver hailing from Mexico, boasts an impressive record in his underwater pursuits. Born and raised near the ocean in Mexico City, Adami cultivated a deep-seated affection for water sports from an early age. Embarking on his freediving journey in 2010, he swiftly ascended the ranks to become one of Mexico's most celebrated freedivers. Adami's accomplishments in the sport are nothing short of remarkable. From constant weight-free immersion to variable weight, Adami's skills know no bounds. Notably, in 2014, he clinched a national record in the constant weight discipline by plunging to an astounding depth of 101 meters in the azure waters of the Bahamas. Ever the fearless explorer, Adami embarked on a daring adventure into the depths of Jacob's well, capturing his bold feet on camera. Descending into the abyss without the aid of supplementary equipment, Adami delved to the depths of the first hole, approximately 100 feet below the water's surface. However, his underwater odyssey took a perilous turn when one of his flippers detached from his foot, presenting a fearful obstacle on his journey back to the surface. Despite the gravity of the situation, Adami remained composed in the face of adversity. Negotiating the narrow confines of the cave, he grappled with the confusing loss of his flashlight, a moment that instilled a profound sense of vulnerability and fear. In a fleeting moment of contemplation, thoughts of mortality brushed against his consciousness. Yet, Adami summoned his inner resolve, gently moving to ensure his survival. With every ounce of determination, Adami shed excess weight by severing his supply belt, hastening his ascent to the surface. Though the ordeal left an indelible mark of trauma, Adami's fervor for dangerous dives remained strong. With unwavering resolve, he pledged to return to Jacob's well for further diving escapades, undeterred by the dangers that lurk beneath the waves. As the summer progressed, it became clear that his passion for the excitement of diving outweighed his fear of danger. He eagerly embraced risks to fulfill his adventurous nature again. The Jacob's Well Exploration Project Jacob's Well has a reputation for being extremely dangerous, and it's widely agreed that only experienced cave divers should attempt to explore it. Recognizing this risk, the authorities established the Jacob's Well Exploration Project to handle the exploration work professionally and minimize accidents. Over the years, Numerous people have lost their lives while attempting to explore the underwater caves at Jacob's Well. To reduce this risk, only the Jacob's Well Exploration Project, JUEP, is authorized to explore these caves. 
The Hayes County Parks Department has permitted JWEP to conduct diving operations at Jacob's Well. The JWEP not only maps and explores the cave system, but also conducts independent research and collaborates with various organizations studying the site. Since the early 2000s, the JWEP has been actively surveying the cave and has successfully mapped all accessible passageways, totaling 6,000 feet. The exploration of Jacob's Well underwater began in the year 2000 as part of a research project with the Wimberley Valley Watershed Association. Members of the San Marcos Area Rescue Team, SMART, were involved in mapping and capturing video imagery of the cave system. However, these efforts were discontinued by 2002. At this juncture, Jimmy Price, a former member of SMART, and Jeff Chance took it upon themselves to launch an independent exploration mission. They dedicated months to clearing vast amounts of rocks and gravel that had piled up on the gravel slope leading to the first major obstruction. This effort allowed them to regain entry into the cave's interior. Upon re-entering the cave, these divers made a significant discovery. They found that the cave did not end at the previously documented point. Instead, it extended for several hundred feet into the karstic limestone. The initial phase of their survey work resulted in a partial map of the deep section of a tunnel and a substantial portion of another tunnel, referred to as B-Tunnel. This map was presented to David Baker, the property's landowner, and the executive director of the Wimberley Valley Watershed Association. This presentation aimed to aid in the preservation of this unique natural resource. As the dives became more complex, more individuals joined the exploration efforts. In 2004, Ryan and Andrea Eastman, along with Rhett and Brooke Carson, became involved. They played significant roles in further extending the exploration of both the A and B tunnels, contributing to the ongoing discovery and mapping of Jacob's Well. The following year, the need for longer multi-hour dives arose, requiring additional support. Ward Beecher and Chuck No joined the effort, and with their assistance, the exploration and initial survey of the cave system were completed by 2007. Many members of the Good Enough Springs Exploration Project were enlisted to join the endeavor, and together they formed the Jacobs Well Exploration Project. This group of volunteer, self-funded cave divers has continued to explore and conduct research activities. They have carefully mapped and surveyed all currently accessible areas of the cave system, documenting around 6,000 feet of passages in the two primary conduits. The valuable information gathered from their surveying dives has enabled the project to create an incredibly detailed map of the entire cave system. This map has been shared with various organizations involved in aquifer protection efforts. The project's survey results have revealed Jacob's Well to be the longest cave in Hayes County. Thank you for watching this video. See you in the next one.